Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, RSM, FranNet, and Benchmark Commercial Real Estate Services. Um, special shout out to Joyce Gibney, our national coordinator, who not only has invited um, our guest speaker, but also invited some neighboring chapters. So, um, welcome to, to those folks as well. Um, I want to welcome tonight's speaker, David Shuckman, who's going to talk to us about how to work as a consultant in the gig economy. Uh, David's an information technology professional with a true passion for technology implementation, as well as applications design, development, and IT operations. Presently, David is an information technology services training and management consultant with his own company, Princeton Technology Advisors, LLC. David's an active leader in the job seeker support community. He's the current executive chair of the professional service group of Mercer County in Princeton, New Jersey. In addition, David is co-facilitator for New Jersey Job Seekers in Princeton, New Jersey. And he's on the boards of the Career Support Group at St. Gregory the Great in Hamilton, New Jersey, and the Breakfast Club of New Jersey in East Brunswick, New Jersey. Additionally, David is often to present topical programs and IT training classes to business groups, adult schools, job seeker support groups, and public libraries. Um, and I want to welcome David Chuckman. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Give me just a moment to get ourselves up and running here. There we go. So hopefully you are now seeing my slide deck. And yep. Good. So uh, um, what we will be doing, uh, just to let you know, a little bit of logistics for uh, Q&A is um, I have two breakpoints or logical breakpoints uh, in the presentation about every eight or 10 slides in. And so we'll stop and have an intermission then uh, for those two times. And there'll be time at the end as well. And I understand the format for this chapter is uh, we like to use the chat for your questions and answers. So that will be fine. And um, I will be looking at chat during the uh, question and answers time. Or um, if uh, Tom or Joyce is still around, you can just uh, kind of screen those a little bit uh, as well, maybe make us a little bit more efficient. But uh, again, to Joyce and Tom, thank you so much for the invitation. I've had the opportunity to meet other FANG chapters as well, and uh, always uh, nice groups of people. And it's always fun to be able to be a part of presenting at the organization. So we're going to be talking about how to work as a consultant in the gig economy. And working as a consultant is an alternative to permanent employment or the traditional permanent employment that a lot of us have had. Uh, a lot of times as our career matures or, or as we get into the uh, second half of the career, there may be opportunities for us, more opportunities working in a consulting environment uh, than only employed by the company. Most of what I'll talk about today is from the perspective of if you needed to be independent or start your own consulting business. Of course, if you were being uh, brought in by a consulting company who then put you on their client, uh, it, it would be a little bit similar, but it may also be different. You may be employed by the consulting company. And so you'll be a full-time employee with them for the duration of the project. And uh, uh, so that's a little different. Of course, you may also work independently and be on what's called the 1099, which is you're an independent and that consulting company will uh, bring you on as a subcontractor. So that's a little bit more of what we'll be talking about when you're independent, okay? Um, so just wanna let you know, there are a couple of program caveats or just some things to be aware of. I am not an attorney, I'm not an insurance professional, I'm not a tax professional. So uh, really what I'm talking to you about is my own journey. I had a 30 year career with a couple of companies uh, being in information technology, uh, twice found myself out of work, uh, once in 2012 and once in 2013, and uh, had an opportunity that ultimately led me to form my own company, Princeton Technology Advisors. So really, I'm just a friend talking to a friend. If uh, you know, we had the opportunity to sit together in a coffee shop and you're wondering how I became independent after a 30-year corporate career, these are the things that we would talk about. 
And you'll find a couple of times during the program, you'll see a little message like at the bottom, you may need to consult your own local tax insurance or business pro attorney professional. And when I mean local, uh, depending on what state you live in, whether it's Georgia or North Carolina or South Carolina, uh, some rules and laws and uh, tax requirements are going to be a little bit different from state to state. So you'll want to talk to someone in your state. Uh, mostly, mostly what we'll be talking about is a little bit of guidance to get you to that point for yourself. And uh, as Tom mentioned, oops, as Tom mentioned, um, I'm an IT guy. I started my own business, Princeton Technology Advisors, in uh, 2014. And uh, what I do is uh, uh, websites, whether it's new websites or a lot lately, I've been doing updates and redesigns. Some of my clients, I help them with some other technology types of projects. And uh, my clients tend to be small business and not-for-profit organizations. For myself, I tend not to get in long contracts or you know 40-hour week pro projects. I tend to get in the more gig, short, burst type projects for my clients. And I'm also, as Tom mentioned, active in the job seeker support community, uh, leading or participating in the leadership of several groups in central New Jersey. So let's first talk about what the gig economy is. And what I find is, and I think you're seeing that too, companies really are beginning to contract with independent consultants or groups of consultants and temporary workers really to help them through a specific project. And the project can be short term, a few weeks, a few months, um, or maybe a little longer, a year or more. And uh, the way the companies are managing their budgets and their project budget is um, they need a certain amount of staff for a short period of time. And then they be able to uh, remove those staff when the project is over. So gig workers, we would be independent contractors, or maybe if we're working for a contracting firm, we may be part-timers, we may be temporary workers, and we're assigned to really short-term relatively or temporary projects, and uh, maybe to fill um, some short-term or temporary jobs. And that's what the gig economy is. For a lot of us, it's going to be the future of work. It's going to be the way we are working in the future. And for me, I made that observation and decision just a few years ago, and it's uh, working well nicely for me. And so what is a consultant? And you know, the word contractor is kind of interchangeable. So if you're wondering, yeah, use the same term. But it's basically someone who provides their skills, their expertise, uh, service advice to anyone else, uh, and they do so professionally. And that's really what a consultant is. And uh, you tend to work on a fixed contract, and it's for a specific project. And that's really what the type of work that it is. In short, you're a, oops. In short, you are a hitman. And in New Jersey, these are the most famous hitmen that I know and go in, do the job and get out. And that's what we are as consultants in the gig economy. Now, there are some differences working as an employee. And if you've been full-time employed for all or most of your career, you know some of these, but there's some differences between this and the way a consultant works. Typically when you're employed, and this could be true also if you're employed by a consulting firm, you would be eligible for benefits. And so that may include medical benefits, personal time off, or profit sharing, matching 401, whatever it is, um, you may be eligible. Now, often when you're working for a consulting company, um, they may have a, a long period of time before they make you or allow you to be eligible for those. Um, but when you work for an, a company for the specific role, when you're hired by them directly, often that's a little bit sooner. But typically as a consultant, there are no paid benefits. Uh, you need to allow for those and account for those all on your own. And we'll be talking more about that in a couple of minutes. Um, some of you may not know, well, you're a finance group, maybe you all know that your employer pays half of your FICA taxes, your federal employment taxes. Um, and so it's 7.65%. Um, as an independent consultant, you pay your full employment taxes, all 15.3%. Typically as an employee, you're paid by a paycheck, whether it's every week, two weeks, monthly, whatever the program is at your former employer or your current employer. And at the end of the year, after the tax year is over, you get a W-2, so that's part of your tax filing. But often as a consultant, you have to issue an invoice 
that shows the hours that you work and you will get paid after submitting the invoice. And at the end of the year, the country, the, co the company that contracted you will usually submit a 1099 MISC. And uh, I'm sure you've seen 1099s before and you may even have the miscellaneous income 1099. We'll be talking about taxes at a high level in a few minutes. Um, you know, your, in, your income taxes, your payroll taxes, they're paid out of your paycheck. And a lot of us grumble when we get that paycheck at the end of the pay period and see such a large chunk of money being removed. But it's a little bit easier for us that way because it's taken out. Of course, we true up after uh, we file our taxes in uh, by April 15th or this year it's May. And uh, but as an independent consultant, you typically have to file estimated quarterly income tax. You have to estimate. So instead of paying it each paycheck, you'll file quarterly. And then you'll true up at the end of the year as well with your annual full tax return. So it's a little bit extra work that you have to do. Not hard at all, just a little bit more. Uh, as an employee, especially after the 2017-18 uh, tax reform, um, you have very limited income tax deductions that you can take. There are a couple that are through your paycheck <clears throat> that are available to you, but typically things like a home office and other expenses related to uh, your employment, you don't have tax uh, many tax deductions available to you. Now, you do need to speak with your own tax uh, advisor about that, but as an independent consultant, um, you have a lot more available to you as tax deductions. And again, you would need to see your tax accountant about that. So for me, as an example, I do have a desktop computer and a monitor. I have my camera, which is separate. I have a separate laptop a printer right by my side, my desk and desk equipment, all that is tax deductible um, for me right off the top. And then whatever's left over becomes taxable at that point. But uh, often as an independent, in, I'm sorry, as an employee, uh, what were officially tax deductions a while ago may no longer be available to you. So just realize you may have those as a benefit to you. So what's in it for the client? Why might the client want to bring on contractors or consultants instead of hiring an employee when they have a work requirement? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. We'll talk about a couple of them. It's certainly easier to hire and let go anybody who's on a contract. And uh, typically when there's an employee, uh, they have to go through sometimes the legal department, especially when it comes to terminating, have to go through HR, go through a whole different approval process when you want to hire somebody. Typically, when you bring on someone as a contractor, uh, there are project costs. And once the project is budgeted, as uh, the hiring manager is able to do is then bring that person on for the term of the contract. It's already built into the budget. There tends not to be a long-term commitment. And for those of you that are on this call who are unemployed, you've learned even as employment, there's really no long-term commitment any longer. Uh, most states are what's called at-will employment, tends not to be contracts in place for employment. Uh, companies hire you and release you uh, at their will. And so, and then they pay you accordingly. Uh, often what happens is the, the client is looking for a very objective and seasoned team member. Uh, and sometimes their objective when they're hiring an employee is not necessarily this. It should be at least objective and seasoned. Um, but often uh, what will happen with employment, they may be looking for a less experienced person that they'll train along the way. But as a contractor, they really want your experience and your seasoning. And, and um, so they want someone who's, a, who's been around for a while. And also, you're definitely going to be expected to bring skills the employed team doesn't have. And that's not always the case when uh, companies hire people. Uh, the reason why a lot of times when they hire people, they want to bring in someone that they can work with eight hours a day. Any skills that are missing, they may be willing to train those people. But when you're brought in as a consultant, you're brought in for the skills that you have. And so it's a little bit different mindset when they hire someone versus when they contract for you. And also in the end, it does save them money because there is a, a set term, uh, whether it's a few weeks, few months or a year or so. Um, they're not paying any additional benefits. They're certainly not paying to train you because they're hiring you, hiring you for the uh, for the information and experience that you have, not paying for your personal time off. They're really not paying for anything, but for being there each hour or each day. 
Some contracts could be hourly, some can be daily. There's all different ways of doing it, but they're just paying you for your time, your expected time. So it tends to be a, a, a term oriented and less expensive for them in the long run. By contrast, not just what's in it for the client, but what's in it for you? Here you are, the employee, and it may be time for you to consider working in a different paradigm to work as a consultant. And there are really some benefits for working as a consultant. Well, for one thing, it fills a resume gap. Uh, I've met a couple of people, a number of people actually, along the way when I've been involved with job seeker support and people have said, I don't want to be a consultant. I'll wait as long as it takes to be an employee, a full-time employee. Well, there is unemployment bias. And uh, if you're unemployed and have a gap on your resume that's more than three, four, five months old, uh, hiring managers are going to wonder why you're not employed. And it's really short-sighted on their part. I'm actually of the opinion all hiring managers should be fired at least once so they can be sympathetic and understanding the people who are unemployed. So you can look at these as short-term assignments to fill that gap on your resume. And that can be very powerful for you. Another thing is, at least while you're on contract, you're usually paid more on an hourly basis than if you were an employee. The reason why there are other time and expenses that you need to account for, and you have that expertise walking in the door. So they will pay a premium for that. And of course, they know that when the contract is up, they don't have to pay that any longer. But at least while you're on the contract, uh, you are typically paid more than the employees. Also, it does give you a current position on LinkedIn. So you have a 100% complete LinkedIn profile. A current position isn't the position just at the top of the employment section on LinkedIn. It's a position that does not have an end date. So it might say, you know, 2016 to present. Present is not an end date. And so LinkedIn does have a criteria, a number of things that they require for you to have a 100% complete profile. And one of the things that you do need for a 100% complete profile is a current position. And so when someone is searching for someone like you, when a recruiter is searching for someone like you, not when they're searching for you specifically and directly, but if they're looking for financial analyst, or if they're looking for uh, chief financial officer or whatever your role may be, um, the people that are 100% complete will come up as possible uh, views ahead of anyone that's not 100% complete. So you do want a 100% complete profile. And you can look on LinkedIn or you can Google other things that you do need is um, you do need to have a, a, a current picture. Uh, you do need to have joined some groups. Um, you do need to have a certain number of connections. You can look up all that a little bit later. It also has the opportunity to give you a greater variety of work experience for your resume. There are some industries that really prefer to hire people from within that industry. It's an odd mindset. Uh, one that's very popular is pharma. Pharmaceutical companies really like to hire people that come from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, a part of it is because of how regulated farmers is and they want that mindset. Of course, there are a lot of regulated industries, but farmer doesn't look beyond that. However, when you're a consultant, they're really looking for you for your core skills that they need on the project, and they may forego the specific farmer experience. So if you don't have farmer experience, you may get a contract in the farmer industry or an industry where you don't have experience. And now that's on your resume and you can leverage that for a future opportunity. And um, also companies are actually more willing to contract for older staff when even though they're considering hire, hiring for younger staff. Ageism exists. There is age discrimination and it's illegal. It's hard to prove. We all know it when it happens, but there's nothing that we can really do about it in most cases. But, and part of the reason why older employees are a little bit more expensive and it's not just from the salary. And the reason why it's not just from the salary is the company will say we have an assignment and it's, we're offering 75,000. That's their limit. doesn't matter what your age is. But other things, the older the employee pool, the larger or the potentially increase of pricing that they may have on their back end and benefits. 
So their average medical expenses may start to go up. Their life insurance that they're going to offer to you may go up, or they're going to have to begin to give you more opportunity to pay a larger premium, percentage premium. And so to attract employees, they want to keep those expenses down. So they tend to hire younger staff for that reason, but they'll contract for older staff because as a contractor, you don't affect the age of the employee pool. So they get, the, they get that benefit of your experience. And some of us may be interested in contract to hire, but not a contract opportunity. And so what I would ask people if they are interested in that, um, uh, um, basically, how do they expect to find a contract to hire if they're not open to contracting? Sometimes the company doesn't realize that they need to hire you until you've been on contract for a few months and that you're the exact person that they need. So be open to contract opportunities because it may turn into a full-time opportunity. And if it doesn't, well, nothing really lost because you got paid while you were on the contract. But if you wanna be open to contract to hire, be open to contract. So, you know, I tried to give you a little bit of reasons why you may wanna consider being a consultant and maybe even, you know, some of the benefits or the possibilities of why it may make sense. But let's kind of, be devil's advocate for a few minutes. And let's talk about why you should not be a consultant or maybe some of the misconceptions or concerns that some people may have. For one thing, uh, you may not be treated as well as other employees. A lot of people have that concern that as a consultant, you may not be treated, treated as well. In some cases, you might not be invited to the holiday party or the summer picnic. You may not be invited to all corporate meetings or team meetings. In my opinion, that part's a little bit short-sighted by uh, the hiring company. Instead of getting your own cubicle or office, you might be in a bit of a pit situation with other people. So uh, sharing a space may be a little noisier. And so some people think that you're not treated as well. The flip side is you may actually be treated better because of you know, the, the need that they have for just you. And I was actually on a contract a number of uh, years ago. It was actually a three-day contract. Go figure that. I was actually contracted for three days. I'm in uh, New Jersey and I was contracted to work in a suburban Chicago. And my contract was signed on a Friday. Monday morning, I was on a plane. And I got to the Chicago office uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning. When I got there, I met the, uh, the boss for my three days, uh, the CIO, Chief Information Officer, sat me in the office right next to him, and that's where I worked. And he gave me a list of people I needed to talk to. One of the people were some of the senior finance and accounting people. So I walked down the hall, and I first cubicle I walked in, saw a nice woman, and I talked to her. And she began to vent. Do you know how long I've been at this company? You're here for 10 minutes and you got this nice office next to John. And I've been here for all these years and I'm still stuck in this rotten cubicle. I really was treated a little bit better. Thought it was a little odd that she was venting to me because she figured, who am I going to tell? But you can actually be treated better. You know, you might be on that contract and be unhappy. No one likes to work in an unhappy situation. And so you may be unhappy uh, working in that organization. Well, folks, you might be hired into a position. You may be unhappy. It actually happened to me with one company. I was hired by a company in 1999, and I just didn't settle in, and I was really unhappy. I wound up only being there four months, and I moved on to another company. So you'll likely move on. And again, the joke's on them. So if you're unhappy, do good work. Do quality work that you know you'll do. Be a little unhappy. Unfortunately, you'll get paid. You'll get experience. You'll fill the resume gap. And then you'll move on, whether it's your next contract or your next full-time employment. There are unpaid administrative tasks. And there certainly are some of those when you're a consultant. For instance, you may be paid for eight hours a day, but you may have to keep timesheets. You do have to, uh, near the end of the contract, stop looking for your next gig. Um, so there may be some additional paperwork that you have to do. Just be aware of that. On the other hand, you typically get larger hourly rates. So some of that indirect time really gets covered by the larger rates. And at the very least, you'll break even. You may even do a little bit better. I need benefits. When I talk to folks who don't want to be a consultant, that's their number one concern. And when I'm talking to people who are unemployed, I then ask them, well, how are you getting your benefits now? Well, some of them um, are getting benefits from a spouse or partner. But in those cases, those people don't really need benefits. In other cases, they're paying for the benefits, whether they've contracted through the Affordable Care Act or the health care exchange insurance companies there 
or um, they're paying COBRA, which can be a little expensive. Well, it's really being paid out of pocket. Well, you know what? When you're a consultant, you're getting paid. And if you're not being given benefits as part of your compensation, take some of that money that you're now being paid and buy the benefits. Don't take the money out of your pocket or your bank account. So that's really a good reason that you should consider being a consultant as well. You know, it may only be short term. I'm really looking for long term employment. I've got a lot of career still ahead of me. And this contract may be short term. And it may be because one of the key features of a contract, especially from the hiring perspective, is it is a term. It, it, will, it will end and the expense will go away when the project is done. Well, that's not really necessarily a bad thing. Uh, if you are on a six month contract for $50 an hour, that's about $50,000. So if you annualize it, that's $100,000. Um, are you happy to work for $100,000 next year? So you may want to consider doing it. Of course, you'll have to budget a little bit, maybe put some money in the bank for your downtime and such. But at least while you're working, you're going to be getting paid. And you know, I used $50 an hour because it was a nice round number, easy for me to do the math. Uh, $50 an hour is probably a low rate for most professionals. So you'll get some good income while you're on the contract. So you know, you may have some of these mindset reasons why you should not be a consultant, but I want to try and contrast them a little bit with why you should maybe consider being a consultant or be open to it. So there is our first um, intermission point. And let's see if there are oh, a couple of questions. Do you recommend creating an LLC? That's from Robert. Um, yes, I created an LLC, and I'm actually be talking about in just a few minutes at a high level um, some of the different sort of entities that you can create. And I did research uh, that in Georgia. So um, for those of you who are in Georgia, I'll have some links for you that you can uh, click on as well. So if you don't mind waiting just a few more minutes, we'll talk more about LLCs and corps uh, there. Uh, Gus has a question. What is the percent difference between a contract and a permanent roll hourly rate. Well, we're going to be talking about how you can compute what a potential hourly rate is for you. You need to find out what the market rate is for what you do in your locale. So it's really um, uh, what you'll have to investigate on your own. But we'll be talking a little bit in just a little bit about how you can begin to find and determine what may be a good market rate. And then Kevin had a similar question. Is 110% of your last base pay an appropriate fair co consultant pay? Uh, maybe. Again, we'll be talking about how you can try and find what the market rate is. Um, probably 110 to 125% is not unreasonable. Um, typically, it is more than your base pay. But you know, I don't know what you used to do, and I don't know what you're looking to do, so it's hard for me to be more specific right now. Um, but we'll talk about that. Um, uh, Peter has a question. What other costs do you have? Insurance, et cetera. Um, yeah, uh, you know, this is um, program, I guess, is like Ragu. If you remember that Ragu commercial, it's in there. So we will be talking about insurance like um, errors and omissions insurance. Uh, remember, friends talking about friends, talking to friends. I'm not an insurance professional, but what I learned from talking to people uh, in that during my process. Um, let's see from Dave, of course, it varies for on the person, but do you have a rule of thumb regarding how many weeks per year, the typical thing member consultant works. Um, no, I have no idea. Um, it all depends on how good you are also of managing your network, looking for opportunities. Um, when your contract is winding down is at the very least the part when you should start looking for your next assignment. And so that way, if you do want to work um, more concurrently, that would be a way to do it. But you know, the typical FANG member, um, I'm not even a finance person. I'm not a member of FANG myself, so can't be more specific than that, unfortunately. Um, let's see, uh, Robert has a question. Any recommendations for seeking or identifying consulting opportunities? So yes, we will be talking about that in a few minutes of where you can generate and how you can generate business. So if you don't mind, please wait. I think that's in the last third of this presentation, but we will be talking about different types of groups where you may be able to find uh, or, or opportunities. Uh, Robert is asking, is the state of California accepting 1099 contractors? 
I don't know. Uh, I have no insight into that at all. Um, I love visiting California and uh, I have no idea at all about what their limitations are about contractors. Um, and I don't know why they would be limiting. They probably, I would guess, uh, are a very employee friendly state. They wanna make sure that people are treated properly in an employment sense. And so if they're really an employee or if they walk like a duck and talk quack like a duck, they're really a duck. So if they're really employed, they should be hired, not on contract, but I'm sure they have rules for identifying contractors. But you're gonna have to look specifically at California. I'm sorry, I just don't have more information on that. So really good questions. Um, any other questions at this time, you could put them in chat or we could just move on. And you can tell I'm from the Northeast because the sandwich is made with a bagel. That's one of the things we do in the Northeast. Okay, so let us move on, open the curtain at the end of the intermission. So a couple of questions about Corp. Do I need my own company? So if you want to be an independent consultant, do you need your own company? Now you may need to talk to your own legal or tax professional, but no, not typically. You can be paid on a 1099 as a consultant without having a company. Um, but do check with your own uh, state to see if they have any specific requirement and why you may have to do so. What I can tell you in general, companies, hiring companies, more and more do prefer to hire independents through a company like an LLC or a consulting company because it does create another barrier that demonstrates that the person or people they're bringing in are not employees and they would not be subject to having to pay those back taxes because they're paying the company, not the person, right? So what if your client does require you uh, to work through a corp? Um, so let's talk about what some of those options may be for you. Uh, for one thing, you can maybe find a friend or colleague who does have their own corp and see if they're willing to hire you and then they could put you on the contract. So your clients would then engage with your friend's company. You will be employed or subcontracted to your friend's company. And then there becomes that legal corporate barrier between you and the client. So that may be one thing to do. I do have my own LLC here in New Jersey. If you contact me and want me to hire you, I will not do that. I just don't hire people. Uh, I work independently, occasionally with some contractors, and uh, I'm not interested in managing um, payroll and all that. It's just not worth it for me right now. You, maybe you'll find a consulting company and you'll bring them the contract and you say, hey, big consulting company. Robert Half is one of the big national ones at DECO. There's a few others. I'm just sure there's plenty local in, in your uh, municipality area. So you may want to find one of them. Do be careful with them though. They're probably going to be very eager to do that because they're going to want that new client relationship. And they may take a very large percentage of the contract rate. It's just the nature of these consulting companies. It's not that they're sinister or evil. And part, part of the reason why they do take a large chunk of the rate is they have a lot more risk. For instance, they're doing the recruiting and they're, putting, they're paying for recruiters as well as um, the client managers. So they have a little bit more overhead. I don't think this is the most cost-effective option, but if you have a relationship with the consulting company, that may be a quick and easy way to do it. An option that may be a little bit better is what's called a split placement company. It's basically a professional employer. That's what these companies are. There's a few of them out there. Uh, when I was uh, an IT manager, uh, one company I worked with for the, those cases was Top Echelon. So you can go look for them, Top Echelon. And so if I found a consultant who did not have an LLC or did not come to me through a consulting company, I pointed them towards top echelon. They don't do recruiting. They don't do any of that kind of work, uh, client searching. What they do instead is they sit there and wait for independent consultants to bring them contracts. So top echelon will contract with your client and they will engage with you and they'll be the company that's in between. You will be employed on a W-2 with top echelon. So um, I, I, had, uh, I was comfortable working with them. There are the companies in the marketplace. I personally don't have familiarity, so I just didn't list them here. 
You can form your own LLC or another corporation. Uh, in Georgia, and I'm sorry, I don't know more about it if you're in North or South Carolina or Florida, or someone mentioned California. In Georgia, the cost to form an LLC is $100 when you do it directly through their, um, uh, their government offices. Um, and uh, each year after, there's a $50 renewal or registration fee. If you work through a, an attorney to do it, or there are websites that will do it that are basically like legal assistance, <clears throat> Um, uh, you can use some of those. You're going to be paying for their services in addition to whatever the, the filing fees are. Um, you do want to make sure that when you form your own business, whether it's an LSC or one of the other types of corps or other limited liability uh, organizations, get what's called an EIN, Employment Identification Number. It's essentially the social security number for the business. So when you engage with your client, you will not give them your social security number. You will give them your corporate or company EIN. And it is nine digits like a social security number, but one dash instead of two that social security numbers have. So do make sure you get that as well. Here's a, a, a list of some common business entities. And this is pretty much across all of the United States. But I want to, before we talk about this, I want to make sure you understand, remember, I am not an attorney. I'm not a tax professional. You will need to speak with someone in your own state or municipality who's much more knowledgeable on this than I am. But again, we're just friends talking to friends. I'm just giving you the little bit of information I know. And also, I'm really going to be talking at a very simplified and high level about these. Uh, each state and municipality has their own laws and regulations. It's also possible some cities, as example, maybe Atlanta has laws that are specific for them that may be different than the state in general. I know in New York, it's like that. New York City, if you filed an LLC, you'd file through the city if you live in New York City, different than if you lived outside New York City in the the rest of New York State. So you do have to be careful and make sure you understand them. So remember, you don't need to form a company unless your client really wants you to. And that's what's just called the sole proprietor. You just say, I'm a consultant and um, engage with that person. Um, you don't need to organize the company. You don't need any organization documents. Yes, you can get a website. Yes, you can get a business card. You can operate kind of like a company, but you're not officially formed as a company. And then there's liability, potential liability or risk that you have. And it's essentially considered unlimited. And you'll also find with LLCs and corps, even though they call it limited, it's unlimited as well. So by that, I mean is let's say you were working in the finance department of a company as an independent consultant, just a sole proprietor, and you made some sort of uh, mistake on one of the books and you cost the company a lot of money and they want to be made whole they'll come after you for the whole amount. Um, and if they have to, you have to sell your car, your house, your kids, you may just have to do that. Your income is essentially passed through. It just shows up on your Schedule C as a miscellaneous income, and you can take expenses against those. Again, talk to an accountant more about that. Uh, then there's an LLC, and this tends to be for independence and small business, the most common one. Now, depending on the nature of your work, you, you may also have option to what's called limited liability partnerships and other organizations that are limited liability. They're all versions of the same thing. Each state has a slight different grouping of them. or So you have to see what's right for you. You are officially forming this in your state. In Georgia, you do it that way. As a matter of fact, I believe all states now do allow LLCs. So you do officially form it with the state. That's a certificate of formation. Liability in theory is limited, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And again, any income that you have just shows up on your Schedule C. You can have partnerships with two or three or four of you can be the partner of the LLC, and each of your tax income will show up on the tax form Schedule C, be reported there. By limited liability, that same scenario, um, your company then uh, engages with a client, <clears throat> and there's some sort of financial mistake, or I don't know, $50,000, the company wants to be made whole, they will come after your company. Well, if someone comes after my company, I told you I got a couple of computers and a desk, I don't have much more than maybe $20,000 worth of, worth of value. So if they came after my company, well, they can get the computers and the, and the desk and the laptop, 
uh, but you know they really can't come after me personally. However, they can come after the worker as well. So if I place myself, which I all, always do, on the contract, and I'm the one through my company that made that mistake, um, they'll sue me and my company. So the liability can still be unlimited. And we're going to talk about uh, liability insurance in a few minutes. So the context, contents of limited is the company's liability, but the people uh, assigned to the project may have a liability as well. And then there's what's called the C Corp and an S Corp. Um, they are separate organizations. Um, they do have a separate tax structure. So really a lot of these are tax structure differences and you will need to speak to uh, your accountant and uh, business professional, maybe business attorney to see if this makes sense for you as well. A C Corp is more or less a traditional corp or what we think of. There is what's called the double taxation because the corporation is um, registered as a legal entity. They file taxes and tax returns, and uh, then they pay you and you are paid an income and your income is taxed as well. So there can be corporate and personal taxes. And you can discuss, you know, is your income a deduction against the taxes at the corporation? Yes, probably go talk to a tax professional again. But, you know, even if you're a sole proprietor or an independent person, it may make sense for you to form a C-Corp and go through that double taxation, depending on the income that you're earning. And the way it was explained to me was this. Remember, your income is subject to 15.3% employment taxes. We'll just say 15%. So, you know, if you're making in your company, you know, give or take 100, 120,000, and that's what's reasonable, um, probably an LLC makes a lot of sense. Just pass through the tax uh, on your Schedule C and don't worry about filing a separate tax return and the costs associated with that. But if you're making some significant money, much more than a reasonable or a legitimate salary, let's say a reasonable salary is $100,000, but you're taking in $250,000 or more, just as a round number, it may actually pay to go down the route of C-Corp, as an example. And uh, the reason why is you'll have to still pay yourself a reasonable salary. You can't pay yourself a dollar. Right. But, you know, if your market value salary is 100,000, pay yourself 100,000. There's still 150,000 there, let's say after taxes. Pay that to yourself as a distribution, a corporate distribution, like a dividend. Don't pay for it. Pay yourself as income or as salary income, as employment income. Don't pay it that way. And that way you will save yourself the 15.3% employment tax because it's a corporate dividend which is subject to income tax, but it's not subject to the 15.3%. So you'll have to talk to your tax professional, but it may make sense. And if you have an LLC for a while, yes, you can change later to a C Corp. And an S Corp is uh, kind of similar. Um, it's a different tax structure and you really will need to talk to a tax professional, learn more about it. But the reason why I added that is every once in a while I've gotten a question, what about S Corps? So it is kind of a separate corp. Um, uh, the income that you get through it actually comes through another form called a K-1. So you'll have to talk to tax and legal professionals about that. So um, remember, this is just friend talking to friend, high level discussion, speak to your professionals about that. For those of you in Georgia, um, here are some websites that you can go to. Now you can take a screenshot if you want, no worries. Um, later, you'll be able to download this slide deck and these links are live in the download. So you can just click on them. Now I can tell you that uh, these like first stop for business information sent in Georgia, Atlanta also has similar websites for starting and operating um, small business. And so they have links as well. So if you were specifically starting one in Atlanta, you can look at the Atlanta um, uh, uh, sites as well. Um, so, um, and here are some others in Georgia, it's called the Department of Revenue. New Jersey, it's a Department of Taxation, that's fine, or Treasury Department, I'm sorry, in New Jersey, but in Georgia, it's Department of Revenue. And so these links have great information. If you're going to start a business, they'll teach you how to register your business. There's a lot of resources that's there, some FAQs and things like that. So certainly feel free to take a screenshot right now if you'd like. But if you missed that or if it's not working well, remember, you can download the slide deck. I'll show you in a few minutes where you'll do that. And all the links in this slide deck are live links in the slide deck as well. 
Um, now, uh, for those of you who are in North or South Carolina or other states, um, you'll just Google, uh, you know, start a business in North Carolina, or if you're in one of the largest cities, see if they have information uh, centers as well. That's how I found this. Um, I've done this presentation in a few states and I've always done the research <clears throat> for the state that I'm delivering. So it hasn't been hard to, to find this information. So one question came up earlier, how much should I charge? Should it be 110%? Should it be more? Should it be less? That's not really the rule of thumb. It's really market driven. You need to understand what the market rate is. In other words, what the typical customer is going to pay for, for the type of consulting you're offering in your geographic location. For instance, your market rate in Atlanta may be a little bit higher than if you're in one of the suburbs or maybe if you're in, um, in a smaller city. So you do have to do that comparison. Uh, where I am in Princeton, I'm geographically located right in between Philadelphia and New York City. And now I can tell you the cities uh, do pay a higher rate than suburban New Jersey, just what I'm seeing. So rates can vary a little bit. So you do need to be aware of what the market rate is, what the market will bear and be willing to pay based on your expertise and the type of services and business you want to charge. So typically, if the market rate or a consultant like you might pay uh, be paid $100 an hour, you can assume the market rate is somewhere between, and I just made this up, but $75 to $125 per hour. Now, if you have a lot of experience in the area that they're hiring you, you might get away with getting a bit more than $100 if that's the average rate. Um, if you're just starting out, if you want to make sure you win that contract, you can lowball a little bit, come in a little bit lower. So you could pay, get paid $75 an hour. And $75 an hour, it's still going to be, you know, give or take about $150,000 a year uh, before your expenses. So do be aware that, you know, $75 could still be some good money, right? But there's no reason why you can't charge more uh, depending on uh, the service that you're offering and the location that you're in. If you want to kind of get a sense of what you need or what you should charge, here's kind of a, a calculator model that you can come up with. Take your last salary. And if you want to include your, your benefits, that's fine. But take your last salary and uh, divide it by 52 weeks. Now you know how much you get paid by the week. And then divide it by 40 hours or round number. Take that salary and divide it by 200. And uh, then what you do is now you know what your hourly salary that you were being paid. You might actually be surprised how little you were paid on an hourly basis, just cash being paid. But then also consider your costs uh, that you have, your expenses that you have. You certainly have administrative expenses to run your business and certain costs that you may have. Um, that you may want to include the, the cost of any benefits that you have to pay for. Um, for instance, if you have to buy your own insurance, your own life insurance and other things like that. Um, if you have rents that are important to you, you have to account for that. Um, maybe you want to account for your personal time off, any of these other costs and figure those out as well. And that kind of tells you what your nut is or what your hope or expectation would be. So that's a way to kind of come up with what you should be charging. Uh, but again, you do have to consider the market. And here's a website where it can help you find what you should charge in your marketplace. It's called founder.com. Again, this is a live link. So if you wait for the slide deck a little later, you'll be able to click on this. And that would be another guide to help you find out. You may also be able to use some of the salary websites like uh, payscale.com, salary.com, glassdoor.com, um, Bureau of Labor Statistics, gov may be another site that you can use as well to see what uh, someone in your role, experience level and location should be paid. And that could help you. So, you know, should I get 110% more? Not, not necessarily. That's not really the way to look at it. You really have to look at what the market is, is going to pay right now. Let's talk about errors and omissions insurance. This is the type of insurance that really is a liability protection insurance, and it protects companies, their workers, and other professionals against any claims of ne neglect or uh, negligence. And so that's what it is. Um, I cannot tell you what this costs because it depends on the type of business that you do. 
Some businesses are more risky than other businesses. And um, you may be uh, buying uh, 500,000 or million more or less. So there's a lot that goes into it and you do need to speak with your insurance professional. It may also be your geography is going to affect it at all. I can tell you it's not typically very, very expensive, um, but you do need to account for the hundreds of a few thousand that this may cost on an annual basis. So who gets sued? Well, in America, everybody gets sued. Um, it's one of our freedoms and uh, for better or for worse. Uh, so typically, if there was a wrong committed by you or one of your employees, if you have workers, um, the employees and the company will be sued potentially. It's basically everyone involved because at the start of a lawsuit, um, the, plaint the plaintiffs or complainants may not know who's truly responsible for the negligence. So you just have to assume that the company and the workers do get sued. Do you need errors and omissions insurance? Well, it depends on your risk tolerance. How much can you support if you were to get sued? How much can you afford? What level of risk are you involved with? So if you tend to be involved with very risky opportunities and projects, you may want to make sure you have sufficient errors and omissions insurance. If you're not doing very risky stuff, you may not need those. Maybe you're working as a subcontractor and they'll cover you. So that may be there as well. And by the way, you have to think about other insurance as well. So do speak to your insurance professionals. I'll give an example. Let's say you're mostly working from home, but every once in a while, every few weeks or a couple of months, you do have to go meet your client in person. So you get in your car and you drive to their office to meet them. Let's put the pandemic aside just for this discussion, right? And then on the way, you get into a fender bender and no one's seriously hurt, but there's some damage to the car. Will your personal automobile insurance pay for the accident when it's being used for business? Now, commuting typically is covered in personal insurance, but business use may or may not be. So you may want to talk to your automobile insurance provider to see if it's covered. If not, they usually tack on what's called a rider. You pay a few extra dollars for that need. Here's another goofy one. Actually, not necessarily goofy. Let's say every once in a while you get a delivery. You, you have to order business supplies. Or maybe um, you're getting delivered product that you're going to configure and then forward or deliver to your client. So you're getting it from the vendor and you're configuring it and then you're sending it. And then so uh, the product is being delivered to your home office, which is in your home. And the delivery person, as he's, he or she is about to drop the package off on your front step, trips, falls, and breaks his arm or her arm. Who's responsible for that? Well, you may say my homeowner's insurance. Okay, but they were delivering business product. And what happens if that came out, that they were delivering it to your ABC insurance company at your address? Would your homeowner's insurance cover it? Would your umbrella policy cover it? Maybe not. Again, talk to your insurance agent. So there's a lot of little things you do need to check off uh, just to make sure you're 100% covered if you are concerned about that level of risk. And there may be others as well. I just wanted to give you a couple of examples that I learned along the way. This is a fun topic. And when I learned about this, um, it was just, it was so, so absurd, it was fun. Do I need to collect sales tax? Now I could say in general, and I can't say specifically in Georgia or other states, but professional services that I would think the typical FANG member might offer would not necessarily be a taxable service. But you do need to check with your own department uh, in the government uh, uh, for understanding that. But um, uh, typically, yes, you do need to collect sales tax because um, products and services are sometimes taxable. And uh, in Georgia, uh, products are taxable unless Georgia says that they're not. As an example, most food items are not taxable. But maybe as a contrast, um, most food items are not, but soda might be, or you guys may call it pop. Is that what you call it in the South? Um, you know, Coke um, or um, 
candies and cakes may not may be taxable because they're not food staples as compared to vegetables and meats and so forth. So you just need to understand specifically for any product that you have. Typically, if you're buying that product from the vendor, you're not going to pay the sales tax. But if you deliver it to your client and they are the end user, you may need to collect the sales tax. Services tend not to be taxable unless Georgia says that they are. And Georgia does have a number of taxes, taxable services or services that are taxable. And you will just need to uh, check in to see if yours are. And sometimes what happens is um, products are not taxable unless it's mixed in with a service. I'll give you an example. Most food items are not taxable. So if you buy a can of tuna fish, a loaf of bread, and a jar of mayonnaise, those are not taxable. If you buy a tuna fish sandwich, that is taxable. It's assembled. So the service to create it makes it a taxable item. So you have to find, just be aware that there's some little quirks with that. For in Georgia, uh, when you do file your taxes, your sales taxes, it's not filed with your income tax. Georgia has an odd one. You re you're required to pay sales tax for the first six months each month. And then you file either quarterly, annually, or what they call a special filing period, depending on uh, the type of business that you are and how much tax you actually have to pay. So you'll have to look into the scenario that's right for you. If you are in another state, uh, go to your own state treasury department or the equivalent and just you know, Google that and get those questions answered. Uh, uh, where I am in New Jersey, I am registered to collect sales tax. I only did it on two projects, so I don't pay sales tax a lot. Um, I do file quarterly and every quarter, except those two quarters, um, I file zero. And so they do have a sales tax return for me. It's zero. It doesn't cost me anything to file and takes me 10 minutes. So in Georgia, here's where you learn about filing sales and use tax. So again, this is a live link and you will be able to click on this to learn more a little bit later. So you can take a screenshot if you like, but when you download the PDF of the slide deck, it is a live link. And here we are at our next intermission. And so we will go to chat. Uh, let me go back, let's see. Okay, so let's see, Gus. Is there any way to have an LLC and do the work without hiring yourself to avoid the potential liability? So um, to the extent of the hiring portion, sure, bring on a subcontractor or bring on an employee have somebody else do the work. The company may still be subject to um, liability as well as the person doing the work. I do not know if you can completely exclude the risk except from um, an errors and omissions in type of insurance and that you would need to talk to an insurance professional. So that was from Gus. Uh, Jeff is asking, how do we get the slide deck? Aha. You will know at the end of this procedure, it is on my, I'm sorry, on the end of this program, it is on my website and I have a slide that shows you where to find it on my website. But on my website, there is a place for getting the uh, slide deck. All my slide decks from 2014 are there, by the way. Um, and Gus is asking, how long should the errors and omissions insurance be maintained after the project? Um, you do need to find out uh, from your local insurance to see what the laws are for you. That uh, just because the project ended is the insurance that you paid for um, that, that ended uh, still in effect or not in effect. Um, you know, it could also be the case that you can buy errors and omissions insurance and then get sued um, for a prior use on the same client. And the new Arizona omissions may cover you for the suit as long as it's purchased prior to the suit. That's kind of interesting. So some states have an odd law like that. So you worked for a, a client, then you bought the Arizona omissions insurance, and they're suing you from starting a point before Arizona omissions. So you may get coverage that way, but you do need to speak to your own insurance professional. Will there be another Q&A break soon? Well, here we are. That's from Tom. Um, so, uh, oh, there will be another Q&A, good. So um, yes, so this is our last <clears throat> uh, break, our last intermission. Uh, we have just a few more slides and then what we will have is the, um, uh, the Q&A at the end of the presentation. But um, while well, we've still got our Q&A time, I'm sorry, our intermission time, 
any other questions that you have, please put them in chat and I'll be happy to address them. Or if it's in a future slide, I will address those at that point. I do find as I talk through these presentations, my mouth dries out, so I keep my bottle of water handy. Yes, it is water just from the local supermarket. It is not anything uh, distilled and stronger, sorry. Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, so let us move on one more time as the curtain opens. So we talked about why you may or may not want to be a consultant. Hopefully I piqued your interest and you are interested in potentially becoming a consultant. We talked about some of the things that you just need to do to prepare for it, whether it's tax or insurance or some other areas as well. And now let's talk about actually how to become a consultant. Now, if we were all in a room together, I'd have you repeating after me this very phrase. So you're muted, I'll take your word that you are saying, I am a consultant. It is that easy. All the legal stuff aside, which is really uh, administrative stuff, it is that simple to become a consultant. You just say and declare, I am a consultant. You hang that shingle. Um, a couple of things you also should be doing. You need to identify the niche and the area where you just have the knowledge and the experience to offer to your clients and your prospects. And you also have to know where your support will come from. And by support, I mean, when you were employed and you had a question, you might be able to speak to a coworker or your boss or somebody in another department. When you're working as an independent consultant, you don't really have that. So you need to find other areas. It could be former coworkers. It could be professional associations, Google, wherever it is. So make sure that you understand that. Uh, as a tech person, every once in a while, I stumble across something I want to do in a program, and I don't know the programming code. So I may Google that, or I look at YouTube. There's a lot that's out there. So just make sure you understand where you can get that support as well. Um, also, make sure you understand your target market and research that. As a consultant, you tend not to be all things to all people. Uh, the reason why is people that hire consultants typically don't hire generalists. They hire experts and specialists. That's why they're hiring you. So just because you are a financial advisor or CFO, uh, that's good. And you probably can take those skills in theory to almost any type of business. But typically the companies that want to hire you want to hire you because you have a specific expertise to them. So that's often the case. So make sure you understand what that market is and begin to alert your professional network, all your co former coworkers, all the people you've met in networking groups, certainly your professionals, like your accountant, your lawyer and business professionals that you know, you wanna to begin to let them know that you're working independently as a consultant because they may be able to work for you. Now, I don't mean that they'll necessarily be employed by you, but when they hear about an opportunity that you can solve, um, they may contact you or reference you in that case. So you want to get them to be kind of your salespeople and your support that way. And develop a business plan. Now, at a high level, I will tell you there are two types of business plans. Certainly, there can be lots more. And I'm going to talk about them quickly at a high level. One is a very involved business plan that could be dozens or hundreds of pages. It'll have all sorts of information about growth rate and the saturation of your market and uh, uh, how you expect to charge and how much you clients you can handle in a given period of time and how you're going to manage the growth by taking on more clients and uh, the cost of your of that growth and how much income you'll generate over time you know all that kind of stuff you finance people you really understand all that much more than i do and then the other kind of business plan is on a sheet of paper and there's a basic difference between the two. And the difference is if you're going to seek financing specific, specifically from banks or venture capitalists, you're really going to have to demonstrate why these organizations should lend you money. And you need that uh, very large, in-depth, well-thought-out uh, business plan. If not, 
you could do very well with a one page or two page business plan that begins to talk about the things that we just identified here, the market that you're going to work in, who, who your support mechanism are, and uh, the knowledge that you have, who the professionals are that you want to keep in touch, basically why you're doing what you're doing. Because if you start to sway from it a little bit, maybe losing focus or uh, lose a little momentum, go back to that one page, two page business plan and remind yourself of where you're working, where your expertise is and what you should target. So those are the two types of business plans. And it could be a single page that's going to be in a manila envelope and that's fine. And every once in a while, you'll take it out of the drawer and you'll just look at it. But do make sure when you write it down, it becomes real and that helps enforce the other things we just talked about on this slide. So now that you are a consultant, among the things you want to do is name and create your company. And I probably should have put this as the second bullet point. But yeah, you're going to want to come up with a name of your company. Now, if you're just going to be a sole proprietor, you can call yourself whatever you want. And I wouldn't necessarily call yourself something like a big company name that um, uh, is you know, if you're trying to confuse with someone else, um, but you can call it whatever you want. You call yourself, you know, Steve's Consulting Company, assuming your name is Steve, and that's fine. Okay. Um, you're absolutely going to want to register your web address, ASAP. Now, that would be done on the same day or even before you register your company with your state. So if you're going to go down the route of creating an LLC or a corp and registering in, in your local state, you're going to want to register your web address the same day or before. The cost of re re registering a web address is only $10 to $20 each. Depends on who you're using to register. Uh, Google is, is 12 bucks if you use Google domains. Uh, so one or two companies a little less and a few companies that are a little bit more. If you're not sure yet what to name your company, um, register two, three, four web addresses. Spend another 10 bucks, another 12 bucks. And then when you name your company, only renew one named that matches your company and let the others expire after the first year. Minimize your expense. The reason why you have to do that ASAP is once you register your company with the state, it's in kind of the public domain. The name of your company and the fact that you're registering it is available in the public. And the reason why is anybody can search the, the public domain to make sure that the name you're, they're interested doesn't already exist. And there are, there are hackers and more appropriately squatters, I'll call them, that look for freshly registered companies, and then they'll register those, those, those domains for $10 each. And they'll sit on it for a year or two. And then if you wait too long and you want a web address that matches your company, it may already be registered. And typically those people tell you who they are because they want you to contact them and pay them to give up the web address. Now, buying and selling web addresses is really very easy. And so the hackers or the squatters, I should say, know that. Uh, and some of them will ask for hundreds of dollars. The most I saw when I was with another company and we wanted a specific name, um, the guy that I talked to held out for $10,000 and we just weren't willing to pay for it. $10,000 for one web address. I understood why he was holding out, but I thought still he was asking too much. Um, and you could develop a website anytime after because nobody is squatting on websites, but web addresses they are squatting on. Let's begin to develop your professional support network. So those people that you identified, those services that you identified as a means of providing support, begin to develop that. Alert your network. Let them know you may need to call upon them. Maybe you need to have a business account with some company and so forth. So get that, start putting that in place. You may need certain licensing, depending on the nature of the business that you're in. And if you're going to ask me if your type of business needs a license in your state, I don't know the answer. You will have to find out. It's very common, for instance, the trades in most states and municipalities require licensing. Um, and some professionals do as well. You'll have to look into that. But certificates may be more relevant. For instance, let's say you're a project manager and I managed million dollar projects in corporate America. I was not PMI or project manager management institute certified. But when I became independent, I found a lot of my co competitors were. So uh, I began to look into it. And to the, this day, I still did not get PMI certification, although I did join PMI and other professional associations as well. So you may need certain certificates. 
Um, same as financial planning. You may have done financial planning for your corporation that you worked for before, and it was fine. But if you're going to now be independent, you may be may, may need to become a certified financial planner and so forth and get that certification. And don't do it alone. Ask the professionals who may be able to help you, um, you know, and the and colleagues and friends and people have done this before you. Get all the guidance that you can. This stuff isn't hard. There are some administrative things that we've been talking with you have to get done. So uh, people have been through it before. That's why we're having this conversation may be able to help you. And then there's also um, SCORE. SCORE is a national association with lots of local chapters. I know in New Jersey, there are several chapters. Uh, one in Princeton, where I'm actually active as a topical presenter. Um, the Small Business Development Centers. So there are others as well. There could be chambers of commerce that you can join. Uh, they're not really giving you advice, but uh, for promoting your business. Um, you may have a business and industry association that may be able to help you as well. Most states have one. Uh, New Jersey does where I am, and it's actually the largest of all 50 states, the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, so get uh, support where you can. And immediately update your LinkedIn profile. Your LinkedIn profile should show that you are a consultant and it is a current position with no end date, it says to present. And people will begin to find you. Even if you don't yet have a project or clients, the bullet points that you put in your LinkedIn profile could be the services that you offer and the products that you deliver and so forth. So those key words are there when people begin to search for you. So let's talk about some ways you can potentially generate business. And these are some of the more common ones, but there are probably more that you can think of. So you're independent and so you hang that shingle and you wanna know why no one's calling you just yet. Um, there are business networking groups that are out there. Um, a couple of the big ones, BNI, uh, Business Networking International, LATIP, those are uh, the bigger ones. Um, these are national organizations with lots of local chapters. Um, and uh, it's also very likely there are dozens of them in Atlanta. Even if you're in a medium-sized town, there could be two or three if there's enough business there. And what their model is, um, Typically, the members of each chapter are the only one of that business. So let's say you want to have a consulting business where you're a virtual chief financial officer for your small and medium-sized clients, and you join a BNI or a LATIP chapter. You will be the only virtual CFO in that business. Now, there may be other professions as well, like a certified financial planner or accountant or IT person. Um, marketing, whatever, but there'll only be one of any profession or line of business. Now, what I mean by line of business, there could be a couple of lawyers, let's say, but one might be family law, another might be business law, another might be, um, a, you know, different type of law as well. Join meetup.com. Meetup.com is not the world's largest dating website. Uh, what it really is, it's kind of like LinkedIn groups on steroids. It's just really powerful. It's a website that is completely free to join as a member. The people that pay for it are the people that create the groups. The independent people, you and me, that are just joining lots of groups, it's always completely free. You do create a professional profile. Uh, when I mean professional, the keywords and descriptions about you are going to be about your business and profession and service offering, not just if you like to paint or you like dogs and things like that. Nothing wrong with those things, but you want to keep it a little bit professional. And then what happens is Meetup, night and day, will look at your profile and compare it to other groups in the area, Meetup groups, and tell you there is a, uh, a Meetup group starting. So you may get an, an email. It might say um, a professional business group for um, certified public financial people in Macon, Georgia go, don't go, you decide. It's really meant to facilitate in-person groups. Of course, through the pandemic, most of them have gone virtual. And I'd say you want to look at two broad areas. One area is look for meetup groups in your profession. Now, these are people that are your competitors, but they may also be your support network. So it would be nice to meet some of them if you need to. So if you're an accountant, you may want to join an accounting meetup group. But the other is the area of your type of client. Remember, research your target market and make sure that you put enough keywords so that Meetup knows that you're interested 
and uh, in certain target market. The reason why is you may get invited or notified of meetup groups that are nearby and attended by business professionals where you have the potential to talk with them and see if you can earn their business. So that you'll wanna join those meetup groups as well. Join and participate in LinkedIn groups the same way you would in meetup groups. You'll join the ones aligned with your profession as well as the ones that are aligned with your customer base. And then that way you'll have the opportunity to meet people virtually as well. The LinkedIn groups tend not to foster in-person groups to the same rate as the meetup does, but it certainly connects you to other people and that becomes a very big help. Attend professional associations and conferences. Again, there are two types for you. One is within your profession and the other is within the profession of your client base. Uh, these tend not to be free. Uh, some of them will charge attendance fees. Um, but if you want to align yourself with people in your profession, go to those. And if you want to have the opportunity to meet pr uh, prospects or clients, prospective clients, you'll go to conferences that uh, um, your clients and your, your target audience would be. And alert your network, use LinkedIn, use email marketing, whatever it is to alert others that you are a consultant and what you are doing. And so try and get them to work for you and be uh, an advocate for you. And be active on social media. And I can tell you, um, I don't know which is the right social media a platform for you. Uh, those of you that may know Marty Latman, who's one of the leaders of FANG, um, his answer to a lot of questions is, it depends. And so it does depend. You need to be on the social media platform where your clients hang out. So you need to kind of find out where that is, your prospects, the people you want to service and provide services to. Um, maybe they hang out on LinkedIn. Maybe they hang out on Twitter. Twitter maybe they're on Instagram. You have to find that out. Also find out where your competitors are, but you want to be on the same platform as your competitors. And in some cases, that doesn't sound intuitive. And a lot of times when I talk in person, people will raise their hand and say, no, I disagree. I need to stand aside from apart from my competitors. Yeah, I get that. You want to stand out from them, which is why you'll get picked. But if you're going to be on the social media platform where your competitors are not, that means people that are looking for people like you and your competitors are looking where your competitors are located. So you want to be where they are. I'll give you an example of that. Um, I don't know what, about your neighborhood, but you may be interested or might want to take the family out to a fast food restaurant. You get in the car and you go to the local multi-lane road and you'll come upon, I don't know, McDonald's. Well, what's across the street from McDonald's? Maybe Wendy's or KFC or Burger King. And each one is down the road or a couple blocks. The fast food restaurants have figured out they, they need to be near each other. The reason why is even though you said, let's go to McDonald's, as soon as the kids see KFC, you're going to KFC. You haven't made your final decision until you see what your choices are. Uh, another good one is, uh, uh, so the Atlanta folks is Home Depot. And I'm a big fan of Home Depot. Um, I just, my wife shops in shoe stores and I shop in Home Depot. Home Depot does have a fairly large department. I don't know how big it is really, but a department that scouts for the location where they're gonna build the next Home Depot. Uh, they take a lot of pride in, in uh, finding the right location. A lot of big stores, big box stores have that. Home Depot's biggest competitor is Lowe's. Lowe's does not have a big department that does that. Lowe's has a department that follows what Home Depot does. And that's why down the road from a new Home Depot is an even newer Lowe's. So that's the way they work. They know that you haven't figured it out until you get there. Let's talk about, before we wrap up, health insurance. What if I need health insurance? Well, if, you're, if you have a, a spouse or a partner that covers you, that of course may be the easiest route for you. In my case, I'm fortunate I have that. My wife does work full-time for an employer and we're covered under her health insurance plan. But if you don't have that, you may need to get health insurance. And it's basically an insurance coverage that pays for medical, surgical, dental, those types of expenses. I'm pretty sure you know about all those. If you are self-employed, you can actually contact just about any insurance company or go to an independent insurance salesperson and ask them to sell you an insurance policy. Um, it probably is a very expensive route to go down because if you were in a group 
where the average of the group can cause uh, the average cost to go down would be a little less expensive, but you may be able to get the perfect customized policy. So that may be one way to get health insurance. Another is to look for a um, professional association. And I'm sorry, I put New Jersey Business and Industry Association, but I'm sure there's an equivalent in Georgia. Each state has a business and industry type of association. Uh, maybe chambers of commerce, if they're big enough, do provide group plans through the professional association where the group members can buy a health insurance at a group rate. And that does bring the cost down at a group rate. So you may want to become a member of a professional association. As example, in New Jersey, the New Jersey Business and Industry Association has a lot of um, uh, uh, packaged pricing on different services. Uh, they, they, you can buy office supplies at a discount through one of the main office suppliers. You can um, contract for shipping <clears throat> at contracted rates rather than you know, in-store rates. And you can buy health insurance. So Georgia must have in North Carolina, South Carolina, and the others similar programs. Go on the healthcare exchange. Now, depending on which state you live in, you may need to go to the national exchange called healthcare.gov. It's called the Affordable Care Act. Um, and when it was first founded, of course, Obamacare. Um, and some states have their own exchanges. And so Georgia does not have its own exchange. So you do use healthcare.gov, uh, but you can look to see if your own state has its own exchange. When you have a state exchange, it's the exact same thing. They follow the rules of the Affordable Care Act, but they're administering it more close, closely to the chest. Pardon me. Uh, most states have several insurance companies and options to choose from, and the insurance companies do offer different plans, usually covered like the, the gold medals at the Olympics, bronze, gold, and silver. Some have high deductibles and lower premiums. Some have higher premiums and lower deductibles. You have to see what makes the most sense for you. You can sometimes speak with your own insurance agent who can give you guidance there as well. If you are 65 or older, you can use Medicare for your medical insurance. Medicare is not uh, all encompassing, so you may need one of the supplemental plans as well. There's lots that are out there. You need to speak to your insurance provider as well. But do keep in mind, if you are 65 or older, that's fine, you're eligible for Medicare. But if your spouse or partner does is not 65, it's younger, or if you still have dependent children, they are younger than 65, they are not eligible to be covered by Medicare. So you may need to look at one of these other options for them as well. And if you uh, are recently unemployed, um, you may be uh, eligible to um, pay for your premiums and insurance through COBRA. You're essentially buying your corporate insurance uh, directly. And that's what you're doing. Um, you have to check to see if the premiums in that case are a business tax deduction. It all depends on the way you're paying for them up front and the type of plan that the company has. So it may not always be a tax deduction. Again, talk to your insurance professional and your tax professional on these as well. So home stretch, we're wrapping up. So consulting, working as an independent consultant, it's an alternative to full-time permanent employment. Now, of course, you can work for a consulting company as an employee, and you may get some of these healthcare and other benefits, but when you're independent, um, it, some of those are on your own, but it, it's an alternative. And the older we get, this may be the more realistic and viable and best option for you. And there are pros and cons, certainly, for being a consultant or for any type of employment. At the very least, it is a resume gap filler. So if your ultimate goal is still to get full-time employment, uh, while you're in a gap right now or unemployed, you may take on a contract so you can fill that gap. You have the opportunity, potentially, to earn a greater variety of experience, make your resume a bit more robust. You'll certainly get paid, and you maybe even get more paid more. And you may even be able to be hired at, from your contract where you may not have seen that position because it was initially only offered as a contract. You don't need to become a corporation, but you can. You have to see what the opportunity is and what makes sense for you. But you simply declare, I am a consultant. And you get started with the things that we talked about. So that is our program. The question earlier, where is the slide deck? So here is my website, princetontechadvisors.com. I actually have two web addresses. 
PrincetonTechAdvisors.com and PrincetonTechnologyAdvisors.com. I have both of them. So you go to that website, PrincetonTechAdvisors.com. There's a menu at the top. You will click on Workshops. And then this is the Workshops page. And then you click on Recently Authored Programs. This is a program, and when it's over, it will be recently offered. The very first one at the top of the list is the slide deck for this program. So you'll click on that. It is a PDF file. You are welcome to download it and use it as a reference as you need. Uh, the one right below this is actually a FANG again of Northern New Jersey, uh, their version of that presentation. Uh, it's basically the same slide deck, except it says New Jersey instead of Georgia. And you'll see other slide decks is there as well. You're welcome to any of them. My stuff is not proprietary. So this is, uh, I guess, the only slide you do need to take a screenshot right now, PrincetonTechAdvisors.com. Click on the Workshops tab, and then the Recently Offered Programs link, and you will have access to the program. If you scroll to the bottom of that page, you'll see there are recently off programs for 2020, 19, 2019, 2018, and so forth. They're all there. You're welcome to any of them. No secrets from me. And um, so questions, any more questions? And I will go to chat right now. Let's see. So from Fernando, thank you for uh, your kind words. But the question is, when you made the decision to do consultant, what thought or event triggered your decision? So uh, I had just come off my second unemployment. <clears throat> Uh, like I said, I had worked for a company for a couple of companies over the course of a 30 year career, started as a programmer and became a, in senior management and technology. Uh, lost my job. I was out for 10 months, landed again with a full time position, which was very nice. And after six months, they had a reorganization. So while I was looking for work after my second unemployment, um, I, I helped people out. People came up to me and said, hey, David, can you help me with my website? One person said, I'm looking to start a blog because they wanted to be out on social media and online a bit more. And I found I was getting these little small gig contracts and I wasn't getting paid a lot because I wasn't looking to. I was getting more than I was getting interviews. And after doing that for about a year, I made the decision to just pursue this on a full-time basis. So that's what did it for me. And uh, I talked it over with my wife and she was supportive and agreeable. And so that's what I've been doing since officially 2014. Uh, okay, so Kevin is asking, will someone send the link uh, to the email or would someone send it to him? So that's to Kevin. So hopefully Tom, you've got the links to and emails of people I can send. You're welcome to send a link to my website or I can send you the the deck, you can send it out as well. Uh, Robert sent me an invitation for LinkedIn, so thank you. Uh, yeah, if you do send me an invitation for LinkedIn, I'm happy to accept. Just remind me that we met here at this presentation. Uh, I'm one of those people, I don't accept invitations from the people who are just clicking the invite or connect button. If I haven't met you before, not that we have to be best friends yet, but if I haven't met you, I don't often uh, accept those because I don't know the intention. Uh, Eric said, thank you. So thank you for that. And Michael did as well. And so did Gus. So great. Thank you, folks. Any other questions uh, before we take a break for wrap up the program? Okay. Well, if not, um, so yeah, I'll just put up that slide again, make sure you have the, the link to the website. And, um, but uh, I just simply want to say, uh, uh, Tom, and I don't know if Joyce is still on, but thank you very much again for the invitation. It was uh, nice to be visiting Georgia, at least virtually. It's been a while since I've been in Atlanta, so nice to visit again. I got to get to the aquarium there. It's supposed to be wonderful, the Georgia Beautiful. Aquarium. So my next trip, that's what I'll be doing, I think. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, David. Have a great evening.